So, as I mentioned, the papacy during the 1300s is in Avignon, France. And this is, again, this is a photo I took of the Palace of the Popes, which, by the way, if you ever have a chance to go to Avignon, uh, which I highly recommend, um, you should do the tour of the Palace of the Popes. It's actually a really neat historical tour to take because uh, it, they have a virtual tour where when you go into the building, you, you, you get this little, this, you know, it's a tablet. And in each of the rooms you go into, you scan the tablet over a little sensor and it'll, you hold it up and it shows you what the, the room would look like in 1345, for example. This is a really cool, uh, one of the better tours that I've taken in Europe. And Avignon is a really neat medieval little town as well in, in southern France. So Pope Clement, um, more than one, multiple, um, resided in Avignon during much of the 1300s. And of course, as we know, uh, the papacy is traditionally um, centered in Rome, the Vatican, right? St. Peter's. The Bishop of Rome is to be the, po the Pope, the head of the church. Well, Italy had, you know, the area around the Vatican and Rome. Italy is not a unified country at this time. Um, and there were, were reasons, political reasons, as well as reasons of economic reasons for the papacy to not want to be there. Uh, the, you know, the, 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 the cathedral of St. Peter's didn't exist as, it, as we, we know it today. Um, the Vatican had kind of fallen to a level of disrepute at the time as well in the eyes of some, and the Catholic Church in the French, um, there were strong connections there. And so they, they, there was a connection politically, and they, they moved the papacy to Avignon. And for nearly a century, the head of the church was in France. This is, again, part of what's called the Great Schism, where there's a dispute, where Italian cardinals are like, the papacy must be in Rome, and French cardinals, the papacy should be you know, here in Avignon, at one point, there's, there's, there's multiple popes disputing who is the legitimate head of the church. So first of all, just to begin with, that in and of itself is a problem for the authority of the Catholic Church um, because it, it, it calls into question the legitimacy in certain areas. It calls into question the legitimacy of the church that's overseeing you know, the, the sacraments, the rites, and the rituals, and so forth. So the church is divided, and that in and of itself is weakening its political authority. However, there are other factors in the 1300s that will play into this to really, really devastate, in, in some ways, the political authority of the Catholic Church. Now, the Catholic Church continues to be a legitimate political entity for years to come, um, but... In the 1300s and beyond, you start to see that almost like sort of universal political power of the Catholic Church, it begins to, to break a little bit. And you start to see the doors opening a bit for the fissures that will give rise to the Protestant Reformation, will open the door to criticism of the Catholic Church even, um, and give rise to humanist thought and other forms uh, of thought that, that would not have been acceptable um, uh, during the height of the Middle Ages, and certainly in parts of Europe still were not acceptable, as we'll talk about when we get to, um, you know, some of the persecutions that individuals during the, the Renaissance and Enlightenment, the scientific revolution, could face. History is shaped often by people, but it's also shaped many times by things that are outside the control of people, like the environment, for example. Um, by the 1300s, the European population was at its carrying capacity. Like, given the technology of farming uh, and these types of things, uh, Europe was at 78 million people, which in 1300 was really close to its carrying capacity, according to scientists. I mean, today, Europe is around about a population of 800 million, but that's made, made possible by, of course, industrial innovations of farming and so forth, which change uh, the carrying capacity of the land. But Europe is really at its capacity, about 78 million. And in the 1300s, you witnessed some 
events beyond the control of people, beyond the immediate control of people, that really opened the door to crisis in the 1300s, which will then kind of pile on that issue caused by the great schism of the Catholic Church, which is already opening the door for some individuals to question aspects about the legitimacy of the church. And then you pile on that an environmental crisis, a health crisis of the 1300s, and you will see it begins to open the door to the future of a Europe where people begin to question the Catholic Church and the political power of the Catholic Church is weakened somewhat. The 1300s is associated with the development of what is sometimes called the Little Ice Age. And um, it's been speculated that maybe this was caused by uh, massive volcanic eruptions in Iceland, which caused the, the temperature of the, of, the, of the climate of the Earth to cool slightly. And slightly, we're talking about a degree or something like that. But that slight uh, cooling of the temperature of the Earth by maybe a degree or so caused for uh, growing seasons that were not as productive. And so farming productivity goes down. This helps to lead to a famine in which 10% of the European population die because they were at the rough, rough carrying capacity. And now you've had a decline in food production because of this environmental event. The result is famine, maybe 10% of the population die. Uh, we will also witness, of course, with the Hundred Years' War, there's wars in other areas of Europe, and you start to see that lead to, of course, lower um, crop productions. And overall, these two affairs of war, environmental crisis, and famine lead to a society that is, is really more prone to disease because the, uh, the nutrition and the calories that they're intaking um, are, are lower than they have been before. And this opens the door to the arrival of the Black Death or the plague, which, of course, remember, talking about... Um, global interconnectivity as a driving force of change in the world, uh, the Black Death, the Black Plague, is probably the most preeminent example of this. You're talking about a bacillus that emerges from Mongol-controlled China um, that was carried by fleas that infested rats, um, and the diseased rats were, of course, carried um, on ships, but they infested people, infected people, and People carried the disease um, into areas of Eurasia. Uh, one of the events, the uh, there was a siege of a of a uh, of a of a town uh, by a Mongol army in um, in the area of um, of, of, um, of the the, uh, the Black Sea near the Black Sea, and. Um, during the siege, the Mongol army became infested with um, uh, the plague, and they began using uh, biological warfare, a uh, rudimentary form against the, um, against the people that were inside this walled town, throwing the corpses of their dead soldiers into the city or with catapults. And eventually the entire city became infested with, um, with, with the plague. And it began to spread, and the merchants got on board their ships, and they sailed back to, to, to the Mediterranean, out of the Black Sea, and they began to seek areas to, um, to port their ships. And eventually, uh, briefly, the ships with diseased rats and diseased sailors ported in Sicily. And, of course, the rats went up the mooring lines into Sicily, and then Black Death begins to spread across Sicily to Italy and then up into France. Uh, interconnection. Now, this is not something that humans consciously controlled. It was just simply that trade routes, moving goods um, uh, over land or, or through war or on board ships, um, carried this illness, which was carried particularly you know, from a flea bite. Uh, fleas that lived on rats that infected people. And once people got infected, the two types of plague, bubonic plague and pneumonic plague, were incredibly infectious. And this is a disease that had never come to Western Europe before. And the ravages of this were some 50% mortality rate um, and incredibly decimated, decimated European cities. 
Um, I might show everyone the video that I've made from Siena, Italy. And in Siena, Italy, there is a, a church that was designed to be a great Duomo-like church, like that of Florence. Um, if any of you know, I'm going to show you a video of Florence, so you'll see that. They were going to build a church that, that rivaled the size of the cathedral in Florence, and they never finished, and they didn't finish because of the decimation caused by the Black Death. And so when you're in the old center of Siena, which is a very neat place to visit because it's it's a small place and in a lot of ways gives you the imaginings of what a, a medieval Italian um, uh, city in Tuscany might have been like. But you see this massive wall that's just there by the church, and it was supposed to be part of this major massive church they were building, and the death toll was so high they had to stop construction and they were never able to to, to build it again. In some places, the mortality rate is as high as 50%. The population of Europe drops uh, by maybe 19 to 38 million, down from a population of 78 million. Uh, and this all occurs in the, um, in the middle of the 1300s, really beginning in 1347. And I say through the 1360s, question mark. And the reason I say that is because the Black Death continued to have it would continue to have hot spots that would emerge here and there in cities. You would have outbreaks, uh, but it never would return to the extreme decimation that you saw in that decade of the 1340s and 1350s, uh, when it utterly just decimated um, Western Europe. And again, this is an example of, of, of the interconnection of the world causing this, but this also connects to the fracturing of the political authority of the Catholic Church, because the reality is the church, who was the basis for medical knowledge, was the basis for religious and spiritual knowledge, it was the basis for any form of knowledge or education that, uh, that existed at the time. Um, bishops oftentimes you know, doubled as as doctors during that period of time. And the reality is, is the Catholic Church had no answer for this. The Catholic Church couldn't tell you what caused it, and it didn't, it wasn't able to tell you what the solution was. So the effect on the population was significant. At one point, the Pope, Pope Clement, had called on a group known as the Flagellants here. Um, and the Flagellants, uh, you know, were, were basically they turned into a band of individuals that um, uh, persecuted Jewish populations, in some cases blaming Jewish people for um, for poisoning uh, the drinking water, and you saw persecutions and pogroms on Jewish people as a result of this. They performed self-flagellation. They would, they would whip themselves, and the idea was punishing themselves might satisfy God's desire to punish humanity for its sinfulness. So there was uh, part of many a belief that sin was the cause of this and that human humanity's like um, sinful nature was bringing the, the end times upon people. Many people would have felt this was the end of the world. These were the last times, these are the tribulations uh, of the end times. The flagellants eventually, because the Catholic Church, again, um, was unable to... Uh, you know, identify or treat people that were, were ill. I mean, they tried to, but it's largely futile. People either lived or they died. There was no meaningful um, way of dealing with this. And so eventually the, fl the flagellants turned on the church itself. And the flagellants used to interrupt sermons and uh, they became like this almost like anti-church entity that the Pope called upon to be put down and to be stopped by local authorities. Um, Cities largely, if you could, uh, you left the city. Lords fled to the countryside, and the people who remained in the cities um, oftentimes um, died at very high rates. Um, people were afraid to uh, bury the dead in some cases. Um, places where people died were sometimes bricked up the windows of them. They d buried people in some cases in massive plague pits, mass graves, because they were um, they died in such in such uh, in such numbers. Um, persecutions of Jewish peoples were so thorough in some cases that there was a movement of Jewish populations into Eastern Europe. Um, and ultimately, you see the sort of inability of the Catholic Church to understand and deal with this, um, coupled with the Great Schism, the fact that Pope Clement is in Avignon. Um, these factors uh, gives rise to 
uh, it opened the, the, the door to criticisms of of, of the Catholic Church, and of humanist philosophy, and eventually of science, and of the Enlightenment, and other ideas associated with the Renaissance and beyond. And these were really a product of, of the Great Schism, of the environmental crisis, the wars, and the Black Death um, during this time period. Pope Clement actually at one point, uh, in his, when he was in Avignon, uh, they built fires around the Pope and the idea was that the fires would somehow um, uh, purge the, the, the polluted air because they believed it was in the air. And uh, the, the thinkers of the Catholic Church actually had turned to Islamic scholars. Uh, they were reading uh, the Islamic scholars as well as some of the thinkers from Paris to try to understand this. And um, nobody really understood it. And they came up with these, these ideas and um, uh, the fires, you know, doesn't really work. Uh, maybe, maybe it, to some extent prevented a whole lot of rats from coming into the papal area, but it doesn't really work. And um, eventually the, the Pope, Pope Clement will return and begin to uh, try to work more with the populations of, of Avignon uh, following this. But this all is like a critical mass in sort of fracturing the, the political power of the Catholic Church at this time.